Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is Josette Manning, Cabinet Secretary for DHSS and Chair of the Committee. I want to welcome you all back. Uh, it's nice to see the familiar faces, and we have some new faces as well. We're going to jump right in because we have a packed agenda, so uh, I'm not going to waste a lot of time with introductory comments, but we do want to introduce our panelists. So, uh, Jules, do you want to run through the intros? Absolutely. So, my name is Jules Galaco. I am the staffer here for the committee. Uh, we have quite a few members on from the committee. I will have them introduce themselves before we get started. And then you will see our agenda is pretty packed, like the secretary said. And we have quite a few guest speakers who I will ask to introduce themselves once they begin their presentation. So Representative Baumbach, if you don't mind kicking us off, then Senator Richardson. Then I'll loop down to Mr. Patel, Elizabeth, and then we'll keep going. Great to say Representative Paul Baumbach, serving in uh, 23rd House District, uh, the greater Newark area. Hi, Senator Brian Rusin, serving the 21st District from Bridgeville to Del Mar and over to Millsboro. Perry Patel, healthcare consultants with open minds, about 45 years into the behavioral health and the medical surgicals, uh, and looking forward to helping how to get more out of the state fund at this time. And I agree the sentiment that uh, Representative Baumbach brought. Good morning, Elizabeth Massa. I'm the Executive Director of the Delaware Healthcare Commission. Thank you. And Dr. Silver, if you don't mind going next, then I'm going to have Ms. Tuxword. And I believe that wraps up our committee members, but I do want to also introduce, we have Christine Dolan and Curry Anderson who are also part of our staffing and budget team. Good morning. I am Dr. Simone Silver and I am at Christiana Care. Good morning, I'm Autumn Tuxword. I uh, spent 18 years in county government and public safety. I am now the um, director of programs for Code Differently. Awesome, I think that's it. So secretary, I'm gonna turn it over to, I believe Vanessa will be giving our litigation update. Let me stop sharing my screen. And Vanessa, you should be able to take over unless you need me to pull up your presentation. Um, can you, do you mind just doing it? Yeah, Sorry. absolutely. Just I, I feel like on. I'm just gonna, you know. No worries. Let me it's just. It's short, yeah. easy to follow along, so. Yep. Are you able to see that? Hi. All right. Yes, we can see it. Awesome. All right, Vanessa. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Vanessa Kassab. I am a deputy attorney general in the Delaware Department of Justice, and I handle uh, tobacco enforcement for the DOJ. Um, I've actually been in this position now for three years. Um, just to give some, we can probably go to the next slide, um, just to give some um, background on myself um, uh, as an introduction and um, for what the tobacco um, DAG does, um, go to the next slide. Um, yeah, give some information for that. Um, we can go back to the agency information. Thank you so much. Um, so the tobacco um, DAG um, enforces and litigates all aspects of the master settlement agreement, um, which is participating manufacturers, you know, that's the original agreement back in 1998, 1999, um, and also enforces and litigates um, the non-participating manufacturer settlement agreement. Um, this position is um, mandated by statute and required in order for Delaware to receive its annual MSA payment. Um, I have now secured um, Delaware's entire um, MSA payment uh, for the past three years without any reduction um, in payments or delays. Um, and then um, as I discussed below, um, you know, in addition to um, making sure that the payments come in through the MSA, I also coordinate with um, other divisions in the DOJ, um, the Department of Finance, um, 
the civil division is involved um, and also state law enforcement and they are in charge and I work with them on retail enforcement, um, multi-state matters that focus on tobacco enforcement um, and other such initiatives. Um, and uh, we can go to the next slide about the payment. So estimated annual payment for um, MSA for fiscal year 2026 is approximately, roughly, again, these are always always rough estimates, $21.2 million. Um, the National Association of, this uh, figure comes from the National Association of Attorneys General, um, NAG, which acts as legal counsel for the state in all MSA um, related matters. Um, so they they represent us on on these matters, and then I represent the state of Delaware. Um, as we all I think know, um, it is estimated that MSA payments are going to continue to decrease um, somewhat. Uh, Delaware is projected to see an estimate of roughly 1.5 to 2 million dollars per year in reduction in MSA funds. Um, that's through at least 2027. Um, and certainly I will update that um, as it becomes, if it changes, um, MAG updates this with any sort of significant changes um, that, that would happen in the market. And um, if there are no significant changes, definitely every year. Um, the, the uncertainties and the factors that are in being involved, um, that are involved in this reduction and why the payments are going down um, our volume of cigarettes actually sold. I'm going to come back to that. Um, the rate of inflation, um, whether menthol gets eliminated from the market, that is still pending. Um, the Biden administration has had rulemaking for quite some time now. It, there's next to no chance that menthol gets eliminated before the election, which is not going to happen. Um, and then we will go from there. Um, but that rulemaking is still pending. Um, it has pretty significant um, pushback uh, from civil rights groups and also from progressive law enforcement groups um, who actually oppose the ban or at least want more thought put into it because of the potential of over-criminalization, um, especially in minority communities um, if, if you know, menthol is, is eliminated. The idea is to not prosecute individuals um, who, you know, might have menthol cigarettes, but um, there's a question as to whether the state will, and local law enforcement will, will follow that. So it's a concern. Um, the biggest the biggest reason for the reduction in funds is uh, is vaping. It's vaping, e-cigarettes, and um, the popularity of those products, which are not included sales from those products are not included um, in the MSA. No funding or portion of that money goes to the MSA. So as the traditional cigarette market continues to shrink, and um, there is some estimates that at least youth use of vaping and e-cigarettes is down, but that market is, is exploding um, to, to the detri detriment. You know, we don't want people smoking, but... Um, regular tobacco sales are, are down. Um, so we can go to the next slide about uh, funding requests. So um, as you can see from the funding request, I'm requesting uh, $274,778 in total funds um, for the program for fiscal year uh, 2026. Um, so as you can see, these are salaries um, for myself, one full-time deputy attorney general, and also a full-time paralegal. Um, I'm so excited to say that I've had a full-time paralegal for the first time in this job for an extended period of time um, since January 2024, and he's doing an excellent job. Um, and uh, we're actually traveling to um, the National NAG Tobacco Conference in Denver next month um, to meet with all the other states, talk about what's going on, um, and get up to date with, uh, with you know where we're going from here. Um, and then, so that would be included in the annual um, out-of-state litigation and meeting expenses. Um, and they also, those meeting expenses also provide the necessary continuing legal education um, that I need to continue doing this work. Um, and then I think the next slide might just be saying thank you. Yeah, so thank you. And I don't know, am I doing questions now or?
for later. I was going to open it now for questions sure. if any community members have. Yeah. I also, real quick before that we do that, I failed to introduce Mr. Fulton, who is here in person with us. So, Mr. Fulton, if you want to introduce yourself real quick. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Don Fulton, long-term member of the HVAC committee and happy to be here in person. Thank you. Awesome. So open it up. Open it up to committee members if you have any questions for Vanessa. If you have any down the road, I think Vanessa, you're going to hang out the rest of the meeting, yeah. I believe. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep, I'll be here the rest of the meeting. So I'll be available for questions at the end. Or Thank whenever you. that comes up. Yeah. Not seeing anyone. I don't, I don't have a question. But you I push do. that light, push the red light. The red. Oh, there you go. I don't have a question, but I do want to just clarify some of the. Um, Deputy Attorney General's comments, a, a major factor for that reduction in the uh, MSA payment is the fact that when we started this, to give some historical perspective, smoking rates were hovering around 30 uh, percent. And I'm not sure what the updated figures are, but um, it's probably half of that now. Um, so that's the main reason. Uh, I'm I'm disappointed and concerned about the vaping issue, and I think we need to do something about that. But I think the major reason for the reduction in the MSA payment is we did our job. Sure, I, I, and I should have <laughs> I passed over that. Yeah, absolutely correct. Um, smoking is down, um, and concerns over e-cigarettes are is up. Um, but yes. Thank you, Mr. Fulton. I'm going to move on to our next presentation. Unless any other committee members have comments, please speak up. Uh, Jules, just a quick question. Is the next one going to talk about the, uh, uh, just like, I know the projection is 21.2. Uh, can uh, we be reminded what the level was for fiscal 25? Uh, fiscal 25. Do we have? Yep. Okay. It was, yep. So we're moving into our OMB presentation. I believe that's, that's included fine. there. That's great. Thanks. And if not, we will definitely touch on it during this conversation. And I can ask, um, look for that myself. Andrea, is that in your presentation? It is not in my presentation. Mine is okay. at higher state level. Okay. I'm going to ask Curry or Christine, do you have that available that you can jump in? Um, otherwise, I'm going to, Andrea, do you want to control your slides yourself? Absolutely. Awesome. I am going to stop sharing. You should have the ability to share your screen. Is there no litigation update? Oh, I just asked Curry to pull what last year the number yeah. was. Can everybody see that okay? Yes, we can over here. Yes. Thank you. So good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Andrea Godfrey. I'm the Deputy Director for Budget Development and Planning. Um, today, we're just going to walk through at a high level um, the financial overview for the state. Um, starting with um, where we landed for um, FY25 and um, revenue forecast for FY26, budget cost drivers, as well as spending limitations and the challenges that we're, that we're facing for FY26. So for the FY25 budget bills, we appropriated 98% of revenue, fully funding the rainy day fund, that's constitutional requirement. The operating budget, uh, appropriated just over $6.1 billion with budget growth of around 9%. Uh, the supplemental bill appropriated $168.4 million. And that includes um, $51 million for post-retirement increase supplement and um, $56 million for other post-employment benefits. Other increases include state employee salary policy, collective bargaining, health care increases for state employees, Medicaid increases, and, and student growth. The FY25 capital bill is less than the last few years, but is still significant at just over $1.1 billion. Um, that includes funds for construction um, of the of multi-year projects, but um, Kent and Sussex County Family Courthouses, K-12, new school construction. Um, there's a Delaware State Police Troop 4 in Georgetown that's being um, currently constructed and uh, funding for state facility improvements and deferred maintenance, of course. 
and it was also set aside for budget stabilization fund, bringing the total balance to 469.2. That's up from 410.1 million for um, over the prior year. And, and that of course will be used for, for future revenue uncertainty. After GRB was released in January 24, uh, the overall revenue forecast increased pretty significantly, almost 400 million across both fiscal year 24 and 25 providing some additional funds for both the operating capital budget as we, move, as we moved into markup. Uh, however, what is not reflected in this slide, but actual June uh, 2024 revenues came in at approximately $20 million less than projected. So while we were up in June projections, actuals didn't quite hit that uh, projected level for FY24. For FY26, June defect is projecting a slight increase in revenues, about 2.3% increase over last year, but expenditure growth has been outpacing revenue at, a, at an unsustainable level with revenues increasing around one to 2% and um, expenditures projecting much higher. Uh, DFAC will meet again on October 21st and December 16th, and that'll provide us a better estimate for the FY26 revenue outlook. As far as cost drivers go, um, we are starting FY26 with uh, door opener estimates of around 400 million. Uh, that's about a 6% increase um, over the FY25 budget. And we have about 2.3% additional revenue. So this is a little bit of a challenge for us as we move into FY26, um, but door openers are um, include Medicaid uh, as well as um, student unit growth. So for Medicaid, I'm sorry, for Medicaid, you are seeing a slight decline in the enrollment. However, um, there are increasing in projected expenditures. Um, that's, we're coming back down to pre-pandemic levels, but because there are decreases in FMAP and increases in provider costs, capitation rates, and premiums for dual eligibles, we are seeing some increased costs for them. Um, student unit growth is also growing. We're looking at about $40 million over um, FY25 for that. Um, we're not seeing growth in students as much as we have in prior years, but we're seeing growth in the level of unit. So rather than regular units, we're going to, um, we're seeing an increase in the um, basic or complex, which are um, more costly. The spending limitations that we face as we begin developing the FY 2026 budget are the 98% appropriation limit. As I mentioned, that is a constitutional requirement. Uh, budget reserve accounts um, limitation um, requires a 5% of gross general fund revenue be set aside. That's more commonly known as the rainy day fund. Um, also as part of the 152nd General Assembly, Executive Order 21 was codified. And so starting in FY 26, um, DFAC will set a benchmark appropriation for operating budget growth, and this will be calculated in both December and May. Um, when looking at the bond and capital improvements bill, cash, of course, will go first to the operating and supplemental bills, and then remaining extraordinary revenue will be appropriated in the bond bill. Um, that means if, if we have cash that's appropriated and needed for the operating bill, less cash to the bond bill. Um, the Delaware does have a debt limit of 5% of estimated net revenue that can be bonded. And so that means a, a smaller capital bill as we move into FY26. Um, and more around the levels of what we had seen pre-pandemic. So what does this mean for FY26? Right now, when we're looking at June revenue projections, we're, we're facing some challenges, as I mentioned before. Revenue is increasing, but of course, not at the same pace as projected expenditures, but we do still have two DFAT meetings before the governor's recommended budget is finalized in January. And um, we have significant reserve balance in the budget stabilization fund. So for now, we're not looking at budget reductions, but we are looking at um, no target growth for, for FY26. So as we look to what's next for the budget development team in particular, um, agency budget submissions are due October 15th. 
for which we have currently set, of course, a zero target growth, but we are asking agencies to provide a list of potential 1% increases. So we're hopeful that additional revenue will become available in October. Um, DFAC does not meet until the 21st, so we won't know that when budget submissions are due. So we're going with the zero target growth for now, understanding that DFAC may come in with additional revenue, which point we'll be able to refer back to that 1% list. And if revenue increases further in December, then of course we'll still have that 1% list that we can look back at. Once the governor's recommended budget is released, we will work closely with the legislature and the Comptroller General's office on adjustments as the final budgets are drafted and voted in June. Okay. And as I as I roll to the questions, um, I will note that I have a couple notes to, to mention here. Um, there was a question regarding the name changes for some of the tobacco fund appropriations. And just to provide a brief explanation, on that uh, as part of the FY25 budget, all of the pass-through appropriations for nonprofits, non-state organizations at a statewide level that had received general fund allocations in the operating budget were moved to the grant need bill. And that's just to more accurately reflect the nature of the funding. Um, so as part of that effort, any nonprofit organizations receiving tobacco dollars that were associated with a contractual arrangement these were all renamed so that the appropriation more closely aligned with the program that was being operated. So that's kind of the, the first issue that I just wanted to make sure everybody was aware of that. And then the second thing, just to reference um, Representative Bombeck and um, Mr. Patel, just to acknowledge, I will take your concerns to um, OMB leadership. Um, part of the, the expectation, I think, moving into FY26 is that DHSS will submit as part of their 1% increase list some of these requests be um, switch funded so that we are in alignment with their request and not the HVAC recommendation being one request and DHSS request being a separate request. So we wanna make sure that those are in alignment as we move into FY26. I'll open the floor to, to any additional questions. Thank you, Andrea. And I did uh, I did want to ask Rep Baum back to bring the topic back up because those conversations did happen before we went live about his concern with the switch funded programs. And I do want the secretary to be able to jump in and speak to those programs that weren't switch funded this year. Uh, so, Representative, would you like to jump in now or would you like the secretary to jump in? Uh, secretary first, sounds good. Thank you. So thank you. Uh, as you all recall, last year, there were several programs that we recommended be switch funded because it seemed most appropriate for those items to be in the department's operating budget versus coming out of the tobacco fund. And I think this group uh, spent a lot of time analyzing that and weighing that and made some really uh, good recommendations, well thought out recommendations, which we submitted. Uh, we did request that they be switch funded. And uh, at the time, we are making those recommendations, our budget submissions were already done, right? So there was not a way for DHSS to go and include those things as initiatives in their budget. So, you know, that ship had sailed last year and, um, you know, this, they were not put in, they were not switch funded. And so they drew down the fund. Um, the situation that we are in this year is that, um, to, to be candid, the, the what Andrea said was the first time I heard that. <laughs> and um, so that's something that the department will um, talk about, but we have our, we've already submitted our door openers. We are not allowed to submit initiatives. So I'm not really sure where those items are gonna go in, in our budget requests. Um, the other thing that I wanna highlight is even if they were going to be part of our budget request, um, without explicit exceptions to the 1% rule, that puts us in a position of having to cut out really critical needs for the department. They get classed as initiatives because door openers have a very specific definition and that chews up that 1%. So some of these items have to compete with those really critical needs. They're not gonna win, right? I mean, the departments have to operate, they have to function. And they're, they already have to make very difficult decisions about what gets put in. And then we, at the leadership level, have to decide as a department what gets put in. So a division may advocate strongly for something, but 
another division might have a more critical need. And in order to fit it into the 1%, we have to make cuts. So it really is, is a difficult position to be in without some explicit acknowledgement that those things would be funded above the 1%. Thank you, Secretary. And to just go back real quick, last year we recommended about just over $23 million in HVAC funding. Tobacco funds ended up being in the operating budget around just over $31 million. So um, it did eat up more because those switch funded were not accepted. So that was just going back to Mr. Fulton, your ask. Yes. So, Joseph, I may, um, and, and Madam Secretary, thank you. And I, I really do get your your serious dilemma. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I would love for it to be something different. I mean, it, I'd look at it and say, um, uh, frankly, this switch funding has to be treated as a door opener. Anything else is, is just imaginary and it's fabrication. These are operating programs that back in 2008, 2009, we're stuffed into the tobacco fund because that's where there are funds. But those funds aren't there. And we're deficit spending to the tune of $8 million. And we only have, what, $12 million left. Uh, this is all going to blow up in two years uh, if we don't admit what the reality is, that these are these are operational costs for DHSS. And that, uh, because they were magically switched off of the operations, uh, these are, in my eyes, definitionally door openers. They are the cost of obligated operations of our state government, and they're being hidden over in the tobacco fund. And that's that that is a recipe for a disaster for these programs and not just the DHSS programs, the programs that all the advocates are here to be talking about with this uh, health fund advisory work. Um, you know, they're going to be gutted uh, if we blow through another 40 percent. Well, it's 40 percent last year. We could go through and we rate another eight million of the twelve. That's two thirds of the remaining balance we would eat through if we fail to recognize if OMB and the process fails to recognize that eight million dollars of switch fund stuff does not belong here and must be moved over the operations. Um, and yeah, it, I agree completely. It's impossible to treat that within the one percent, uh, you know, guideline there. Um, it absolutely must be treated as a door opener. Um, so I encourage uh, at the cabinet level uh, that this discussion be elevated to the very top and make sure that it gets addressed uh, to have it be reality and so that we do not have a disaster with these programs two years from now. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. And we can definitely have further discussions on how we might message that both in our end of the year report that we will submit by November 15th, but in general, what conversations need to be had. And I will say there's no disagreement on our end of what you're saying. And I appreciate you bringing that to attention. Is there anyone else has comments on this? I'm sure we'll get back into it as we move forward today and throughout this fall, but any other comments before we move to item four on our list? Um, anyone? I'll just make a comment to amplify the polls. Fulton, if you Pop on, is that oh, green? You did. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, just to amplify the representative's comment, um, the high water mark for our reserve account was about 75 million. So it's not just the 4 million that it went down in the last fiscal year. It's the 60,000 plus that we have lost over the last 10 years. So it, it, it's, it's an unsustainable uh, uh, reduction if you consider what we're trying to accomplish here with, with the health fund. Thank you, Mr. Fulton. Anyone else? I'd just like to echo that had we not had this fund, how would have the state government run otherwise for the DHSS? So I think we almost have to part the two separate pieces in order for us to get the true pictures of where we stand. Understood. Thank you, Mr. Patel. And like I said, this will definitely come up in further conversations. But for now, we're going to move to item number four on our list. That's the overview of Delaware health trends. Uh, we have this presentation every year just to kind of set the tone of where we are in terms of uh, tobacco use, substance uh, abuse or misuse, mental health, chronic diseases and such. So we do have 
quite a few of our members from the Division of Public Health and then our Division of Substance Abuse and Mental Health. So I think we are going to start with Claire Wang with our Division of Substance Abuse and Mental Health. And I believe Caroline Judd is also going to be jumping in with her um, to present this as well. And Caroline is with DPH. So Claire, did you remind me, did you want to control your presentation yourself? Awesome. Yes. Yep. So you should have the ability to share your screen. You can jump right in. And I believe Kara, I'm, I apologize if I'm pronouncing it wrong, Caroline or Carolyn, you're more than welcome to jump in as needed as well. Thank you so Thank much. You. Can everyone see my slides? Yep. Great. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Dr. Claire Wong, um, and I had the pleasure of serving as the SAMS Associate Deputy Director over the past four years. Um, thank you for the opportunity to highlight some trends in substance, substance misuse and mental health today. Um, as many of you know, September is National Recovery Month and also uh, Suicide Prevention Awareness Month. Um, I'm also thankful that Caroline John, my colleague from the Division of Public Health, um, is also here uh, who, can, who I can lean on for questions. So behavioral health is broad and complex. So um, given the constraint of time, today I will only highlight a fraction of notable trends. I'll start by taking a glance at the frequency of SUD, uh, substance use disorder, and mental health conditions in the emergency department visits and how it has changed over time. Um, I'll then offer two deeper dives, opioid overdose, and also mental health suicidal crisis. So using, uh, this is DPH information, using the emergency department visit data as a doorway of syndromic surveillance. Here you can see that the ED visits rates for mental health, alcohol-related, suicide-related, and opioid overdose, um, as, as portrayed here, compared to traffic-related ED visits as a benchmark since 2019. This demonstrates the order of magnitude of mental health related visits, as well as other addiction related uh, ED visits. So as you can tell here, mental health ED visit rate has decreased since 2019, but remains at a level that is higher than alcohol, opioid, as well as traffic accidents. The early decline here at national levels during the COVID-19 pandemic, but we're still working to understand the possible drivers of the continued decline post-pandemic um, of these mental health related visits. I would like to hypothesize that better access to community-based mental health treatments um, and also case management to prevent mental health ED visits and hospitalizations might play a role. So DSAM funds SUD and mental health services supporting individuals who are uninsured or underinsured. Um, this underinsured point, for example, Medicare does not cover residential treatment so DSAM covers that um, if the patient is eligible. In FY 2024, based on the data submitted from across our provider uh, network so far, our treatment system served over 24,000 patients with nearly 32,000 treatment episodes across mental health and SED. One important infrastructure I would like to share with the committee um, that Delaware has built over the past five years is DTRAN, the Delaware Treatment and Referral Network. This is a bi-directional e-referral system for behavioral health providers. Um, and today, more than 700 referrals were sent or received electronically each week between more than 300 providers across the state. Um, our division continues to expand the network to offer better and timely access. And there is a DTREN 360 care coordination platform on the horizon to ensure continuity of care. So next, allow me to underscore a few data points um, related to drug overdose in Delaware. I want to thank our colleagues at the Division of Public Health for this slide. Um, despite some progress, Delaware is still experiencing an overdose death rate nearly twice as high as national average. Based on 2022 cities and mortality data, Delaware ranked second in the country in opioid overdose death and fourth in the overall drug overdose death. Based on the preliminary data from the Division of Forensic Sciences here in Delaware, we lost 228 Delawareans in the first eight months of this year due to suspected overdose. While these numbers can change after final confirmation, 
we're seeing early signs that Delaware's efforts to reverse the opioid uh, epidemic may begin to have an impact. Um, more than 90% of Delaware's drug overdose deaths involve at least one opioid, especially synthetic fentanyl, while more than half also involve at least one stimulant, like cocaine. While Delaware used to have high rates of prescription opioids, the trends have declined by 40% since 2025. Um, finally, CDC estimated that 89.9% of the overdose deaths in Delaware had at least one potential opportunity for intervention. Um, I will unpack this in a few moments. Well, but first, um, here you're looking at a month-to-month -month trends of suspected overdose deaths um, over the past three years. Even though the numbers will come, come, be confirmed later, these are suspected overdose deaths. DSAM leverages this sentinel information on where the epidemic is heading and where the suspected overdose death events are happening in the states, so we can deploy our resources, such as Narcan distribution and post overdose response teams, uh, in a more data driven and timely fashion. I mentioned earlier that we have recorded 228 suspected overdose deaths this year so far, um, and that is 33% lower than the same period in 2023. Again, things can quickly shift in the fall and winter months, um, but we're cautiously optimistic. Before moving on, I wish to use the statistics published on CDC's Souter website in 2022 to underscore the importance of many of our own work on prevention and harm reduction. I think partly thanks to our state's high quality of data when it comes to reporting and reporting the circumstances surrounding progress death, we're identifying opportunities to create programs and linkages for people to get help when, wherever they're in their recovery journey. This means saturating Narcan distribution across the state and educate people about the danger of using alone. This also could mean addressing mental health along with addiction. This could mean getting more people into treatment, uh, which is uh, MOUD, quickly for SUD, especially as soon as someone experiences an overdose. So this also means working with the correction system to make sure people leaving incarceration is connected to treatment. So a lot of work is ongoing. Switching gears to highlight a few things about mental health and suicide crisis, which is a key area of system-wide expansion given the recent federal and state legislation and investment around the behavioral health crisis continuum, including the passing um, of House Bill 160 last year that established Delaware's Behavior Health Crisis Service, uh, Crisis Intervention Services Board, and a 988 telecom surcharge here in Delaware. In the past two years, we lost someone in Delaware to suicide every 2.5 to 3 days on average. Um, in 2023, 144 Delawareans perished by suicide, up from 133. 133 in 2022. Based on CDC data, 57 of all suicides in Delaware were by firearms, and 60% of firearm deaths were suicides. And we know a much larger number of the population struggles. The federal agency often reminds us that for every person died by suicide, approximately 316 people seriously considered it. But we know suicides are preventable. Um, in 2021, like the rest of the country, Delaware launched 988, the three-digit number for anyone in crisis to reach the suicide hotline. In FY24 alone, Delaware's 988 answered 5,299 5, calls and helped someone in crisis. So this having someone to talk to during a mental health or suicidal crisis is the first of the three components of the comprehensive crisis continuum which is someone to talk to, someone to respond, which is the mobile crisis teams, and somewhere to go, crisis st stabilization facilities. In 2023, we counted nearly 24,000 crisis calls across the three crisis hotline operators in our state. In addition to 988, which is operated by Contact Lifeline, a Wilmington-based organization that has served the state for 40 years, the adult crisis line and youth crisis line also serve a significant volume to help um, to help seekers. It is a transformative moment in the field of mental health. There are tremendous efforts across the state around mental health awareness, suicide prevention that I don't have the time to cover, but these and welcomes, dialogues, and of course, your partnership. 
So thank you for your attention. Um, please don't hesitate to reach out if you have questions. Thank you very much for that presentation. Are there any questions? Some. Thank you, Dr. Wong. Uh, up, up okay. next. Up, oh, good, Mr. Patel. Just wanted to share, as we know, we have Behavior Health Consortium, and also they are getting the funding on the POSDC, that is the Opioid uh, uh, Distribution Settlement Distribution Commission, just like what we have with the Tobacco Fund. So I just wanted to make sure that we have some kind of a, I do see I attend most of them being the commissioner on the POSDC, but I just wanted to make sure that we have better align between these two. And they do have a little bit bigger dollar amount that's coming through because of the reasons. So I just want to make sure we have some kind of a, maybe even a um, couple of sentences every meeting to know where the where we have the alignment between the two. Thank you, Mr. Patel. Any other comments? Okay, we'll jump into it. Looks like um, Helen, are you okay to go next? Absolutely, happy to go. I got a lot of slides, so I don't want to take away from too many folks, but I'm happy to go. I'll try awesome. to run. You, yep, we'll have you jump in, and I think you were going to try and do your slides. If not, I have a copy as well. Let me see if this works for me. Um, yep, we, we can see your screen. You just have to put it in. Yeah, presentation mode. mode. Yep, yes, presentation yeah. mode, some sort. Okay, hang on a minute. I'm sorry. Presentation mode. There it is. There okay. we go. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Let me move some things around here just so I can see my slides and my notes. So good morning. I'm Helen Arthur. I'm Section Chief for Health Promotion and Disease Prevention with the Division of Public Health. As I mentioned, I have quite a few slides and much of this is for informational purposes only. Uh, not only, but for informational purposes for the advisory uh, committee as you as you all do your review of applications. So I may jump through some of these fairly quickly, just in the interest of time. So before we get into the health data for Delawareans, I wanted to highlight briefly the BRFIS program, uh, the DPH program, and a health fund advisory um, committee new application this year is a foundational element. Um, to public health programming. And much of the information that will be shared with you today does come from our BRFIS survey data in Delaware. Um, another thing that's important to note is that this is the nation's premier uh, system of health-related data. It is collected in all 50 states, as well as the District of Columbia and three U.S. territories. I won't spend a lot of time on this slide, but this is just a brief overview, and it really does highlight the fact that um, there's been a lot of changes that have happened with the BRFIS over the years. Um, our target sample is 4,000, and that's really based on the size of Delaware in general, and it is also a CDC minimum sample size for the state of Delaware. So several years ago, CDC provided adequate funding to fully cover the cost to administer the BRFIS. However, this is no longer the case. And each year, it's becoming more and more challenging for us to solicit supplemental funding from other state agencies and community partners. So usually this is an exchange for something like a module that may be of specific interest for that organization. And so it can cost an upwards of $8,000 uh, per question um, to administer these surveys uh, nationally. So I just wanted to have that information in here for you all to take a look at. And if uh, we have further questions or opportunities at a later point, we can talk more about them. So uh, it's like I said, I won't spend a lot of time on this one again. Um, it's there for your information if you need it. So now we will transition into the health data that DPH tracks to ensure uh, public health programming in the state. So in 2021, it is estimated that 70.6% of Delaware adults have at least one chronic condition. For purposes of this presentation, I just want to really draw your attention to um, the various numbers here uh, associated with chronic diseases in the state. We're looking at obesity, diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol, tobacco use, and um, all state uh, 
cancer, all site cancer. So it's uh, more than 268,000 Delaware adults are obese. More than 110,000 Delaware adults have diabetes. More than 312,000 Delaware adults have hypertension. Um, and more than 304,000 uh, Delaware adults have high cholesterol. More than 140,000 use tobacco products. Um, and we'll get into a little bit more. I can't really compare... Um, Answer, but I will say that there have been 121,483 cases among adults uh, between the, the time period of 1999 and 2021. So let's move through to the next slide. Delaware is meeting the goal set. Uh, the goal for 2023 was 11.9% cigarette smoking prevalence, and this was achieved. Uh, the 2023 estimated prevalence for adults who smoke cigarettes was 11.3%, which is down from 17.7% in 2016. So despite significant progress, tobacco use remains the leading preventable cause of death and disease in the U.S. The good news is uh, that seven out of 10 smokers want to quit smoking. Uh, the costs are massive, according to the CDC, at $300 billion, with $225 billion uh, of that being for direct medical care for adults and more than $156 billion in lost productivity. So uh, I just wanted to have that information there for you all. Cigarette smoking prevalence has decreased 48.2% since 2011. We heard a little bit about that earlier in an earlier presentation. However, the picture for um, other tobacco products and youth is looking quite different, and it is cause for concern. This slide show trend uh, of high school students who have ever used electronic vapor products uh, and the prevalence, both the state and Kent County has hung around 40% in 2015 and in 2017. And now in 2019, only Kent County residents are, um, information is, a, is available and that's a story for another day, but the prevalence of electronic vapor products exceeded 40%. And as of this presentation, only Delaware and national data are available for 2021. And among Delaware high school students, 33.4% reported ever using e-cigarettes compared to 36.2% among U.S. high school students. So in 2023, vape use appears to have fallen to 14.4% among Delaware high school students. And this is a data point in which we really need to watch closely to see if this is an actual trend or just a sample vari uh, variation. So the national 2023 YRBS data set has not been released yet, but we will be looking forward to receiving that information. So per an earlier question on the meeting, um, I just wanted to highlight that 11.3% of Delaware adults smoke cigarettes and 1.3% of youth smoke cigarettes. So tobacco products um, use appears to be down um, among Delaware public high school students in 2023. This will need to be closely monitored to determine if this is again a trend or is just a sample variation. We will take a look at that. Uh, the rapid rise in e-cigarette use is particularly concerning, especially when scientific evidence is rapidly mounting that e-cigarettes are just as or nearly as dangerous as regular cigarettes. Still, one third of high school students have tried e-cigarettes in 2023, and 18.3% had smoked or vaped e-cigarettes in the past month. This is a serious public health threat. So in 2023, 43.4% of Delaware high school students reported being physically active for at least 60 minutes per day for at least five days per week. The prevalence of obesity um, among high school students has increased over the past two decades. According to the Youth Risk Behavioral Survey, the, uh, the U.S. has seen a 53.8% increase from 106 in 1999 to 16.3% in 2021. So Delaware has kept pace with this increase in obesity, and obesity among Delaware high school students has increased 78% 
from 10% in 1999 to 17.8% in 2023. Again, we are waiting for the YRBS 2020, 2023 data set to be released. So this information is here for your review, um, and it's all relative to chronic disease in Delaware. And adults with a healthier diet live longer. They have lower heart, uh, risk for heart disease, certain cancers, type 2 diabetes, and obesity, and can better manage chronic diseases and avoid complications. However, an individual's ability to consume a healthy diet is influenced by their access to affordable healthy foods. And many communities have trouble assessing healthy foods, whether due to a lack of grocery stores, offering healthy food options nearby, or um, just high prices of healthy foods in general. So this information is there for your uh, review. Now we will move on to uh, chronic diseases. The prevalence of diagnosed diabetes in Delaware adults has more than doubled since 1995. So in 2022, 13.3% of all Delaware adults have been diagnosed with diabetes. As age increases, so does the prevalence of diabetes. And this is a persistent trend over time. Uh, and Delaware adults living with disability have consistently doubled the prevalence of diabetes compared to Delaware adults without a disability. So there has been an increase in diabetes in both non-Hispanic white and non-Hispanic black Delaware adults since 1995. And while in many years, the difference between non-Hispanic whites and non-Hispanic black, blacks uh, are not a statistically significant, non-Hispanic Black adults <clears throat> consistently report having a higher prevalence of diabetes compared to non-Hispanic whites. So as noted on this slide, 20% of obese uh, Delaware adults have diabetes and 13% of overweight Delaware adults have diabetes. The prevalence of hypertension among uh, Delaware adults has risen from 27.2% in 2001 to 37.9% in 2023. And this increase is statistically significant. However, it's important to note there was a major methodology change in 2011. So this methodology change may have impacted prevalence reporting. Again, this is for informational purposes, only uh, something we probably already know, but there's a growing body of evidence that um, shows that will support that pre-diabetes, pre diabetes, and obesity can lead to increased hospitalizations uh, relative to contracting the COVID virus. And per the CDC, the prevalence of many chronic conditions has increased since the pandemic started. So now we will take a brief look at cancer screening data. So among Delaware adults who were eligible for lung cancer screening, 24.4% had a CT scan for lung cancer in 2022. Lung cancer screening is a painless procedure and efforts are being made within the Division of Public Health uh, cancer Prevention and Control Bureau to increase lung cancer screening among the eligible uh, populations throughout Delaware. So we're doing things such as marketing campaigns, community events, and other education events. So more to come on lung cancer screenings in Delaware. In 2000, 93% Nope, 93.9% of non-Hispanic Black women had received a mammogram within the past two years, compared to 86.9% of non-Hispanic white women. Likewise, in 2022, 79.3% uh, of non-Hispanic Black women had received a mammogram within the past two years, compared to 73. 1% of non-Hispanic white woman, women. And during this time frame, non-Hispanic Black women ages 40 and older had a higher prevalence of receiving a mammogram within the past two years compared to non-Hispanic white Delaware women, except for in the year of 20, 2014. And this is another slide that's for informational purposes only. And I will note here that screening for life program 
targets Delawareans who are uninsured and underinsured and helps them to pay for cancer screenings. The above figure uh, illustrates completed screenings for breast, cervical, and colorectal cancers from July of 2018 to June of 2023. And overall, screenings increased in 2022 and 2023 compared to 2020 and 2021. And we all know why that is as a result of the uh, COVID pandemic. So DPH, in partnership with the Delaware Cancer Consortium, continues to seek innovative partners to help ensure most vulnerable Delawareans receive timely cancer screenings. So that information is there for you. And if you have any further questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to our program. Uh, so the demographic makeup for screening for life clients is visually represented here. Again, this is uh, for information purposes uh, for you to consider health fund applications for this year. Uh, the bar chart in the upper left uh, shows educational level attained by Screening for Life applicants. The pie chart on the upper right of this slide, it provides a breakdown of active uh, Screening for Life clients by county. Uh, important to note here, our greatest number of clients is 2,283 in Sussex County, um, with um, followed by Newcastle County with 1,106, and Kent County with 107 active clients. So we've got some work to do in Kent County with this program. Um, the clients by gender is on the lower left bar chart. And the lower right illustration, we can see the number of Screening for Life active clients who reported having chronic disease at the time of the program enrollment. So um, some of you may know we've gone through a data modernization within the Screening for Life program, and we are able to really um, hone in on a lot of great data relative to our Screening for Life program here in Delaware. So these numbers demonstrate the importance of cancer screening programs, such as Screening for Life, but also for preventive and education programs to mitigate, to mitigate um, <clears throat> the occurrence of chronic disease. Um, so Delaware, uh, 2016 to 2020 all-site cancer mortality is higher than comparable U.S. rate, higher than the comparable U.S. Rate. And among the top cancers affecting Delaware and the United States, Delaware had a lower cancer mortality for prostate and colorectal cancers compared to the United States. Delaware also had a higher cancer mortality for lung and breast cancers compared to the United States. This chart is hard to see because I can't see it either on my screen. So I will highlight a few disparities um, because I believe last year there was an interest in disparities data. So I wanted to be prepared this year to share some of this information with you. Uh, Non-Hispanic Black Delawareans are disproportionately more affected by breast, prostate, and colorectal cancers compared to non-Hispanic white um, and Hispanic uh, Delawareans. Non-Hispanic Black women have a slightly higher mortality rate for breast cancer compared to non-Hispanic white women. Non-Hispanic Black men die from prostate cancer at almost twice the rate compared to a non-Hispanic white, uh, to non-Hispanic white men. Non-Hispanic Black Delawareans have a higher mortality rate for colorectal cancer compared to non-Hispanic White Delawareans and Hispanic Delawareans. Non-Hispanic White Delawareans have a higher mortality rate for lung cancer compared to non-Hispanic Black and Hispanic Delawareans. Hispanic Delawareans die from stomach cancer um, at a higher rate compared to non-Hispanic Black and non-Hispanic white Delawareans. Um, and so our programming, you know, we focus on these disparities. I wanted to make sure I highlighted them to let you know that we are watching that and we are actually um, doing our programming to address these through a, ver a variety of uh, methodologies such as marketing and outreach and community events. And we're looking at specific zones um, to really figure out how to adjust our programming so that we can um, target in and hone in on some of these disparity rates I just mentioned. 
So according to the Behavioral Risk Factor Survey, um, non-Hispanic Blacks had a slightly lower uh, prevalence of meeting the USPSTF colorectal cancer screening recommendations compared to non-Hispanic Whites. And finally, I will end with this informational slide that is here just for your reference, which estimates the economic cost of cancer in the U.S. Uh, a key takeaway here is that the cost, $245 billion, and the largest type of um, uh, cancer type expenditure is around lung cancer, prostate cancer, and breast cancer. So um, I'll stop there. And Jules, I will turn it back to you to see if there are any questions. Thank you, Helen. That was awesome. So much, so much information. Like Helen stated, we'll be sharing this um, both via email with the committee members, and this will be posted publicly on our HVAC website and most likely on the public meeting calendar where this um, meeting invite was stored. Does any, do any committee members have questions for Helen? Right. I'm not seeing any, but Helen, do you expect to hang on the rest of the committee meeting? Yes, I will be on. Awesome. Thank you. If you could just stick around, I'm sure that there'll be some other topics of conversation. Absolutely. Awesome. If you could just stop sharing your screen, I'm going to point over to Sequoia Rent. She's with DPH. She's going to give our presentation on the Healthy, on Healthy Communities Delaware and the Innovation Fund. Um, and we do have Kate DuPont Phillips as well here that we need, if we need to tap into her. Uh, Sequoia, do you want to share your presentation yourself or would you prefer I pull it up for you? I have it up in front of me, if that's okay. Awesome. That is perfect. I appreciate it. The floor's all yours. You can go ahead and start sharing whenever you're ready. Okay. Actually, wait, did I miss? Hold up. I think I missed Leah, actually. Sorry, Sequoia. Leah. Okay. You are on, I believe, to do maternal and child health with DPH as well. Sorry about that, Sequoia. It's okay. I got ahead of myself. So, Leah, if you don't mind, are you able to share your screen or I'm more than welcome to present for you if you prefer? See Leah on. Got hearing from her. She was um, on earlier. Yeah, she was on early on camera. Um, I'll share. I'm last... going to guess that she. Pro there she is. Okay. There she, cool. I'm, I'm awesome. very sorry. I had to go to the restroom. I, yes, I, <laughs> yes, everyone step away if you need to. You have a little lab, uh, break for the restroom. I appreciate it. It was a long meeting. Uh, but Leah, you are up. Would you like to share your screen or do you prefer I share your presentation? Sure. I'm going to share it and that way awesome. I can. Um, Thank you. Well, you missed me almost skipping over you. So, oh no. Okay. All right. I'm happy you're back. We appreciate it. Very your flexibility. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, oh. So, looks like we can see it, Leah's. Can you see my slides? Yep. There you go. Awesome. Right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, I am Leah Jones Woodall. I am the Section Chief for Family Health Systems at the Delaware Division of Public Health. And I'm here to share with you some maternal and child health trend data. And uh, so let's begin. Um, first slide. Um, I wanted to kind of tell a story as much as possible and really starting with adverse uh, maternal experiences during pregnancy in Delaware. And you can see here by the slide, adverse maternal experiences, we do ask a series of questions during our uh, PRAMS pregnancy risk monitoring as assessment system. It's a surveillance uh, survey that we house internally at public health in my section and ask a questions around um, adverse maternal experiences around separation and divorce is one um, experience. Um, homelessness is another. So really getting um, a, a, an understanding of job loss, um, uh, hours cut in pay, um, uh, partners, uh, uh, you know, abuse, jail time of a partner, 
So these are just uh, some of the um, adverse maternal experiences that are impacting uh, women's health. And the prevalence of adverse maternal experiences has been declining in Delaware, but what we're really trying to monitor is an uptick in the three or four adverse experiences uh, from 2020 to 2021. And you know, post COVID, we're gonna keep monitoring these trends. And you'll see over the course of the series of slides that there is a, um, a connection between adverse maternal experiences and poor birth outcomes. Something that I wanted to share with you is that there is an increased risk for women of color. Uh, three to four times, they're more likely than white women to experience complications during pregnancy and childbirth and die complications. And this is really important to the work in, in the space of maternal and child health. We have a lot of different stakeholders and interventions that are looking at uh, disparities and improving the health of women before, during and in between pregnancy and in definitely taking a, a health um, equity um, and disparity approach to our work. Um, we work really closely with the Maternal and Child Death Review Commission. Um, they are monitoring uh, maternal deaths uh, through their Maternal Mortality Review Committee. So I wanted to share with you um, uh, the uh, ratio and um, of uh, pregnancy-related mortality ratio. Right now it stands in Delaware overall at 17 0.6 per 100,000 women, but you can see the disparity here increases significantly uh, when we're looking at data for Black non-Hispanic women, 38.9, and then Hispanic women. So this is something that we're, uh, you know, working closely on, um, and it, with the maternal and mortality um, uh, review committee data, we are looking at some of the the outcomes, uh, some of the interviews with some of the women in these families, and it helps us use information to drive our interventions and our work in our state. Um, for severe mental illness, opiate use disorder, substance use disorder among women with a delivery hospitalization in Delaware, uh, for total SUD rates, we anticipate that it is a combination of serious mental illness and opiate use disorder. And the rates include both morbidity and mortality. And with SUD being the number one leading cause for maternal um, uh, mortality, we often learn about SUD after overdose. Um, and we anticipate rates are higher um, than captured due to low reporting given stigma and concern for reporting to our child welfare system, DFS. For severe uh, maternal morbidity, um, the rates are higher for cases needing blood transfusion. So uh, this infers that with morbidity rates, the rates are greater for more severe, higher acuity cases than for less severe, low acuity, case, acuity cases. So meaning that when a birthing person experiences a complication or morbidity, it is more likely to be more severe. Uh, you will see here on this slide, severe maternal morbidity. Um, the black um, severe maternal uh, morbidity rate in 2021 was about two times that of the white non-Hispanic severe uh, maternal morbidity rate. So when you stratify by race, we can see the inequity with more rates of severe maternal morbidity in the black Hispanic patients as compared to white patients. So, and we're seeing the Hispanic patients are significantly rising. Um, and so that's that's something that we're monitoring very, very closely. Um, postpartum depression symptoms and the prevalence in Delaware. So um, this is something that's really important in the space of maternal um, mental health um, conditions such as depression, anxiety, and uh, coupled with SUD, they're the most prominent complications of pregnancy and childbirth and postpartum. And according to the CDC, one in eight women experience depression and 50% of those are untreated. 
So untreated postpartum depression may extend beyond mom. And if moms don't feel bonded to or are unable to care for their baby or their infant, it may not, uh, that baby may not develop uh, appropriately and bond and thrive. So it's really important that we're monitoring and supporting and screening for depression and, and, and making sure that women are connected with support. Um, something that has been um, calling a, attention of support at the national level, but is also a resource um, to uh, the nation and, and, and states is 1833-TLC-MAMA. So it is a maternal mental health hotline. So I wanted to make sure that I um, shared that resource and that is something that we are trying to um, raise awareness around um, and make sure that women are connected to resources and support. Uh, so now we're gonna go into um, birth outcomes. Um, you know, preterm births are the uh, number one driver of our infant mortality rate. And you could see that our preterm birth rate um, is around uh, 9.1, I'm sorry, 11.11%. 11 <clears throat> and it has, um, it's been unchanged since 2021. So so right now it's for 2022, our preterm birth rate is about 11%. So that is something that um, the Delaware Healthy Mother Infant Consortium, which uh, my section and partners are working collaboratively, collaboratively together to address our preterm birth rate. We want to lower that to the lowest in the country. Um, and that that would be around 7%. So that is a aspirational goal is to lower our preterm birth rate, which is driving our infant mortality rate. Uh, adverse maternal experiences here, um, wanted to highlight of poor birth outcomes increased with more adverse maternal experiences. Um, again, so this is really important for us to support women um, and making sure that um, we are supporting them um, so that we can improve health outcomes. Neonatal abstinence syndrome, um, for those that are not familiar, it is the, the medical term for conditions caused when a baby is withdrawing from certain drug, drugs, um, most likely opiates, um, exposed or, uh, prenatally um, before birth. And most babies with neonatal abstinence syndrome get treatment in the hospital after birth. Um, there's a lot of work happening in the space of the Delaware Perinatal Quality Collaborative which is a standalone um, entity working on standards of care and practices in the birthing hospitals. They look at cases and do um, uh, 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 um, CQI, continu continuous quality improvement, and making sure that uh, women are supported in the hospital, but also during um, when babies are in the hospital that they are, they're fussy, they're hard to soothe. So there's a lot of standards of practice and. Um, and care for those infants, like skin to skin, swaddling and best practice standards standards to improve their, their outcomes. So it's wonderful news that you can see the downward trend in our needle, neonatal abstinence syndrome um, declining over the, uh, the years here uh, stated on the slide, which correlates with the mild decline in SUD over the years. Um, I do wanna mention an intervention that has been really supportive in this space is uh, evidence-based home visiting services where nurses um, or uh, uh, um, social uh, a specialist, social uh, service specialists will go into the home to help um, with um, healthy uh, uh, prenatal um, care and also stay with the mom after delivery and you know monitor and support women, whether it's um, connecting them to resources and making sure both mom and baby have good health outcomes. So that is something that we um, definitely are supporting uh, women who are struggling with maybe mental health or SUD um, and making sure that we're monitoring support of these women in the home. <clears throat> so moving on to our infant mortality um, rates, neonatal mortality, post-neonatal mortality rates, I wanted to share here um, that you could see um, that our five-year infant mortality rate for uh, a Black non-Hispanic uh, women, uh, or sorry, infants decreased by 10%. Um, Hispanic infants saw a 39% uh, 
uh, decline. Um, and then white uh, non-Hispanic saw a 29% decline during uh, the same time period. Um, something that I do want to call out, though, is that we are also seeing a significant increase in our five-year post-neonatal mortality rate, and that is deaths of infants aged 28 days to one year. So that increased uh, for um, Black non-Hispanic infants um, for the post-neonatal uh, infant mortality rate increased by 63%. So this is something that we're monitoring very closely, and this may include um, SIDS, so sudden infant death syndrome, maybe unsafe sleep practices for infants. So this is something that we're monitoring very closely. Um, our uh, Another slide that depicts our disparities for infant mortality, um, irrespective of the place of residence that you could see here, we stratify this data by um, county, um, the city of Wilmington, um, for those uh, five-year Black um, and non-Hispanic infant mortality rate was 3.8 times of the white non-Hispanic rate in Kent County, 3.3 times of the white non-Hispanic rate in the city of Wilmington, 2.9 times of the white non-Hispanic rate in the balance of Newcastle County, and 2.6 times of the white non-Hispanic uh, uh, infant mortality rate in, Su in Sussex County. So uh, definitely taking um, a, uh, a, an approach on addressing health disparities is something that's very important to us in our work, in our interventions, in our state, by geographic re region as well. Um, so moving on to our, um, this is a, hold on, I'm trying to move here. The percent of children who currently have a learning disability, attention deficit disorder, or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, depression, and anxiety. So these are an, another area of, of importance to us in maternal and child health and monitoring um, anxiety behaviors. Um, and so we're trying to do more developmental uh, screening. Um, it's a national performance measure for us to increase the rate of developmental screening using a validated screening tool at a certain milestones based on the American Academy of Pediatrics. It's really important that once we screen, we are identifying um, children and having early intervention. Um, so this is something that has been um, a, an opportunity for us in the state to work with our pediatric uh, practices to do more screening, but also in our early learning programs as well. Um, so we work across uh, departments with the Department of Education on the increasing rates of developmental screening um, and certainly with our pediatric community. Um, and so this is another slide that I wanted to share with you um, on, uh, Hold on, I'm just trying to move this. Okay, a percent of children uh, who receive developmental screening using a, a, a validated screening tool by demographics. And uh, you can see here um, that our developmental screening was lower among Black, non-Hispanic, and Hispanic children as compared to white, non-Hispanic, and families below 200% federal poverty level as compared to that 400% uh, federal poverty level. So we, I want to make note that screening is lower among uh, Black patients, but we also see that the ACEs are higher in, um, in Black patients. So we're, we're definitely trying to um, monitor and support in, in this space as well. And finally, um, uh, I wanted to address um, ACEs. Um, and adverse childhood experiences reported by a parent and guardian between the time periods of 2016 to two, uh, 2021. And you can see the prevalence of two or more ACEs increased by age. And the prevalence of ACEs was significantly higher for Black non-Hispanic um, children as, as compared to white non-Hispanic 
and the prevalence of ACEs decreased with increases in federal income poverty. So ACEs is highest among children with uh, those that are uh, above two are below two hundred percent of federal po federal poverty level. So that is it's important to be cognizant of the downstream impacts to infant and children, and if we do not address the upstream early impact of maternal uh, health. So you could see the the story that I was trying to show between the slides shared with you today. So that is my presentation. And if there are any questions, I am happy uh, to answer. Hi, Leah, this is Josette. Thank you so much for that presentation. It was uh, excellent, a little depressing if I'm honest, but um, really good, helpful information. Um, I did have a question on um, slide 14, which was the slide regarding children with learning disabilities. It made me curious about the data because it's reflecting students um, 3 to 17 who have been di currently diagnosed according to that. But there's a drop from 2017 to 2020, which I don't, I'm not really understanding how that happened. Do you know? I, I don't, but I can go back. This is from the National Survey of Children's Health. Um, and I can go back and see with uh, my epi and, and kind of help um, add some some depth to your question. Um, um, so Thank I, you. I'll go back. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions from committee members? No. All right. If we do, we'll have some time at the end. I am now officially going to thank you, Leah. I appreciate it. And thank you to the others who have already presented. Uh, I am now officially going to switch over to Sequoia. If you are ready now, I promise this isn't a pump fake. Okay. So you can go ahead and share your screen whenever you're ready and get started. I appreciate you being here. Thank you. Can you see my screen? We can, you just need it in presenter mode. All right. There we go, <clears throat> awesome. Thank you. My name is Sequoia Rent. I am the Chief of the Bureau of Health Equity at the Delaware Division of Public Health. And I'm presenting today on Healthy Communities Delaware and, their, and the Innovation Fund. <clears throat> Excuse me. You know, make sure everybody can hear me because sometimes there's volume issues with um, Zoom and Teams and stuff like that. So can you guys hear me too? I can, we can hear you here in the chapel and others. Great. Wonderful. Okay. So um, the backbone of Healthy Communities Delaware um, is managed as a public-private partnership between the Delaware Division of Public Health, the Delaware Community Foundation, and the University of Delaware Partnership for Healthy Communities. It is a network of community and investment partners working to improve health, well-being, and equity. Oh, good. So we know that our individual health is shaped by where we live, learn, work, and play. Place matters for our well-being. And 80% of our health and well-being is shaped by our communities. The factors outside of the healthcare system um, is shown on the screen. That's why Healthy Communities Delaware was created to facilitate increased investment in communities to address the root causes of poor health. You can see that healthcare is sh um, showing as 20%. It's the bottom of our figure there. Um, health behaviors like tobacco use, diet and exercise, alcohol use, sexual activity is about 30%, physical environment 10%, and 40% um, of those socioeconomic factors, such as education, job status, family, social support, income, and community safety, and others. So vital signs like our heart rate, our temperature, our weight, things like that tell us what's going on in our body. The vital conditions tell us what's going on in our community and in the world around us. The vital conditions are properties of places and institutions that we all need all the time to reach our full potential, including food, humane housing, access to meaningful work and wealth, and a sense of belonging. The sense of belonging and also includes participating in the decisions, policies, and systems that affect us. Some questions we might ask, sorry, you can't see the vital conditions for health and well-being um, wheel there are what makes a community or 
our what makes a healthy, safe, and vibrant community of opportunity. But the community vital conditions and social terms of health, again, are what all people need all the time to thrive and for all of us to reach our full potential. The Healthy Community Delaware Partners partners with communities to accelerate improvements in the vital conditions and the social determinants of health. Hopefully the um, vital conditions for health and well-being in this wheel are not new or the first time, this is not the first time you're seeing these. So since fiscal year 20, Healthy Communities Delaware has provided continuous investment to nine ACD communities. Since fiscal year 23, HCD has provided continuous investment to five additional HCD communities. The fiscal year 25 funding that's shown here was just released in July. So 7.79 million distributed to HCD communities through the HCD community investment process. 4.2 million additionally distributed on federal funds on behalf of DPH using the HCD infrastructure to achieve equitable and rapid distribution of funds. 15 HCD communities and 23 partner organizations receive, receive support for place-based resident-led community re revitalization efforts. And there are 78 community-driven projects funded through HCD community investment processes. Since fiscal year 20, HCD partners have obtained over 20 million in additional funding from other sources that increase the impact of HCD investments. So you can see here, I'll just feel like I should read it to you, but um, these are other additional funding that's been obtained by the partners between 2020 and 2024. Healthy Communities Delaware started in fiscal 20, fiscal year 20 with nine communities and 12 community-based partners. They also acquired aligned funding from other investors to go to communities, including a three-year commitment from Highmark for $1.5 million. Between that aligned funding and the increase to $1.5 million from HVAC for fiscal year 23, we were able to grow the communities that we're partnering with from nine to 14 and the community-based organization partners from 12 to 23. So HCD is investing in the community-based infrastructure needed for equitable change in 15 geographic communities, 23 community-based partners, and six investment partners. These maps show the communities that HCD is partnering with to create thriving places for thriving people. They are chosen from eligible geographic areas that have high social vulnerability. The work on the ground in each community is led by local community-based organizations or coalitions. They span Kent, Sussex, and Newcastle County. And as you see here, um, like, and like I stated before, they are resident and community-led. The HCD partners are working with residents to envision and create communities where all people can thrive. This table highlights just some of the transformation work that HCD investments have contributed to. Comprehensive community assessments and action plans, a child care center plan, four park playground plans and an assessment, vacant lot assessments and plans, um, plans for career training centers, 79 homes have received critical repairs, community gardens have been created, new child care centers have been created, farmers markets, um, two commercial spaces have been created and renovated. 50 adults have received resident leadership training. 72 youth and eight adults have received career training. And the list is here, but is um, this is only some of that work. In the winter of 2023, HCD surveyed partners to understand how they've used HCD investments and or support to build their capacity and advance their community's vision or plan. The quantitative and qualitative results indicate that HCD partners value HCD support very highly. 100% of partners reported that HCD funding support helped them build their capacity to advance their community's vision and plan. These are some quotes from HCD community partners. I'll read just a couple. HCD has guided many of our most productive partnership relations, relationships and connections. 
This has led to incredibly innovative work in both concept and practice. HCD offers a great set of supports to community development organizations across Delaware and has filled a void by system systematically working to strengthen the sector. So work on the vital conditions of social determinants of health takes years to come to fruition. This shows the work of our community partner, Be Ready Community Development Corporation, over the four years during which they received HCD funding. They have increased their capacity to facilitate community transformation and are creating a mixed-use development on 4th Street in Wilmington that will have 18 units of affordable housing and commercial space on the ground floor. This is an example of the importance of sustained investment to create communities of opportunity. HCD funding helps to support staff at Be Ready, and this has enabled them to build their organizational capacity, which in turn puts them in a better position to address more community needs and community goals. In fiscal year 24, they supported the growth of their food pantry, hosted several youth serving programs, launched an affordable home ownership program, managed renovated transitional housing units, provided capacity for civic association meetings, hosted community events, and strengthened relationships with residents in the community. Here you can see between, like I said, those four years, some of the things that they've done highlighted. And in those, you should be able to see the vital conditions of health and well-being reflected here, increased civic muscle and leadership, increased economic development, increased affordable housing. So we thank the Health Fund Advisory Council for its investments to improve health equity in Delaware and hope that you will continue to invest in healthy communities Delaware and our partner communities. We are working together to create healthy, safe, and vibrant communities across Delaware so that all people have the opportunity to, thr to thrive. I'm going to stop sharing and pass it back to Jules for um, any questions. And Kate is here also. Thank you, Sequoia. Any questions from our committee members? All right. Thank you, Sequoia. I appreciate it. And thank you, Kate, for being a uh, panelist for us today, just in case. So next up on our agenda. Jules, can I make a comment? Absolutely. Just <laughs> Absolutely. Ms. Fulton, if you just introduce yourself, too. Yeah, I'm Don Fulton. Um, I, I, I can't let this presentation go by without uh, congratulating the Health Fund Advisor Committee on establishing the Innovation Fund. I know it took us a while to get it up and running, um, but to give some historical perspective, the 10 or 12 year period leading up to the establishment of Innovation Fund saw um, the amount of the MSA significantly going down and reserve accounts uh, balances also significantly dwindling. Uh, which meant that we couldn't fund many of the programs the way we wanted to in the past, and we couldn't entertain new programs, which was my biggest concern, one of my biggest concerns. But to look at the short history of um, the Innovation Fund and to recognize that we are now funding 78 projects that had or likely had not, uh, were not gonna be funded without this. And we have attracted in, a, in an environment where MSA funds have dwindled significantly, we have attracted an additional $20 million of revenue. I think that's an incredible success story with uh, under any uh, measurement. Uh, so uh, just wanted to say congratulations to this committee for the uh, the foresight in establishing this innovation fund. Yeah, this is Perry Patel. I wanted to also echo Mr. Fulton's, and again, I think probably he and I are one of the probably previous generations of the healthcare people, and I wanted to commend him for um, getting this through the initial seed time. And I believe it is making a significant impact to our communities. I'm really, really happy that we did this. 
Thank you, Mr. Patel. Any other comments from our team? All right, well, Secretary, it looks like next on our agenda, and thank you to our presenters. Thank you, Sequoia, and thank you to our DPH and DSAM team. Um, and again, as well as Kate for being here. Uh, next on our agenda, we have future planning sustainability. I do want to look ahead real quick. We have a couple more things on the agenda, including application discussion and public comment. And then, of course, just the mention from the secretary in our next meetings and adjournment. So I do want to just make sure that we have that 10 minutes for public comment. However, we have about eight minutes to play with. So, okay. um, secretary, I'm going to defer to you. I think we should start this conversation. And then I also want to hit, I'm curious to hear from committee members. Last year, we began specifically inviting some applicants to have questions answered or engage in open conversation. Particularly last year, we invited new programs, um, but there were some off, offhanded questions. I think Delaware Hospice joined us at one point. So I do want to just poll the committee members on any specific programs. If you could, at this moment, let me know or shoot me an email so I can, for our next two meetings, schedule those individuals to specifically be here whether it's in person or online. However, I do wanna know, we have about 30 participants today in the public. So that's awesome. That's a lot more participation than we've had in years previous uh, because we have been asking attend, uh, applicants to attend and listen to these conversations, especially as we focus on the dwindling funds. Um, so secretary, defer to you if you have any programs, any committee members, if you could let me know. Um, and then I do wanna just kick off the sustainability conversation, but we are gonna get into a specific program discussion um, October 15th. Thank you. So this is Josette. Um, you know, I want to make sure we you this committee before I got here made some changes to the application. Uh, again, there's some recognition that the fund is dwindling and we really have to be uh, thoughtful in how we approach the funding. And so developing that applica application a little more, focusing on some measurables uh, and really giving us the information to analyze and work with, I think was a really great uh, thing to do. And now we have that. And what I encountered last year as the new chair was that it was all very abrupt, right? We got these applications, the binder this thick, and there's tons of information. And it felt like, uh, at least from my perspective, there was a lot of pressure to sort of get through it. And maybe we didn't have, or at least I'll speak for myself, um, didn't have the grasp of all of the applications as well as I would like to when the time came to actually vet them and discuss them. So in an effort to address that, we backed up the timeline a little bit to give the committee members an extra two weeks of, of padding. And the hope is, is that we've utilized that, we've really reviewed these applications and we come ready with our questions and that we know the programs we're going to have questions for uh, somewhat in advance so that we can invite them to be present because it was really helpful to have the folks here when we had questions about their programs or questions about their application. With that said, uh, I would direct this to the participants and the applicants. A question can arise at any time, and this is you seeking funding. So if I were you, I would probably attend them all to make sure there weren't questions about my application and I wasn't there to answer them. So I would encourage folks to attend as many of the meetings as possible, regardless of whether you've been invited or not uh, to do a presentation or to speak specifically to your application. And I would ask all of the committee members to ensure a thorough review of all of the applications so that we can move more quickly and more thoughtfully. And then when we get to the point where we have to make those hard decisions about what are we including, what are we recommending, we're all well-versed in the programming and the application, applications that we have in front of us. That's my hope, that's my goal. Uh, with that said, it, as Jewel stated, I don't know that we have to run through it live here. Um, but if you know programs that you'd really like to hear from, feel free to put it in the chat or share that. But again, as Jules stated, you can email her and we will make sure that those applicants are present for discussion next time around. Um, if we don't hear any particular requests, I will proceed as we normally do, which is sort of start at the top and, and work our way down unless the committee has a different preference. I'm obviously I'm uh, open to any other ideas to make this a, uh, an efficient and thorough process. Uh, I'll start if, if it's okay. Um, mm -hmm. So there's three things that- Sorry, I'd like that, to... that's Mr. Fulton. Yeah, I'm sorry, sorry. Fulton. 
Um, there's three things I'd like to see happen. First of all, I, I would really like a presentation by the new programs. And um, when we ask them to present, I'd like them to specifically address um, duplications from current programs we're funding. Because as I, as I read through some of these, it seems like they're doing a lot of the same things that some of our existing programs are already doing. And not that these programs are bad, but um, I'd like to see us eliminate duplications if possible. Uh, the second area is the workforce development area. When we started funding, particularly the nursing support programs, and this has been a long time, this has probably been 15 years, there was a significant shortage of nursing personnel available. And we did this specifically to increase that. So I'm wondering, is there still a shortage? And how are, is their program specifically addressing that? That's great. We'll do some collaborating on the back end and yeah. identify those. I think there's four of them in there, Secretary of the Workforce Development. Yeah. So yes, correct. We'll, we'll contact them and see if they can speak to that. I'm sure they do have some valuable information on mm -hmm. some impacts. And I will go back and look at those applications. Thank you, Mr. Fulton. Is that all you have? Well, there's, a, there's also a numbers thing. Um, mm -hmm. Under new programs, the I'm not yeah. good at math in my head, but uh, it shows uh, the subtotal at uh, yeah. 4.25, and I just added that up in my head, and it's a little over 1,200. Yeah. So where is the 4 million uh, delta? Yes, thank you for addressing that. We realized there was a formula um, concern, so I'm going to pull that up on my screen right now. Mr. Fulton's talking about down here at our new programs. You'll see I updated it. Um, it was previously about, like you said, four, four something. 4.257, yeah. So uh, the mistake there it was formulated incorrectly oh. to include from G772 instead of 77. So thank you for that. This new fully funded scenario will be updated. And then I did want to mention down here, uh, these numbers were just showing the deficit that we had um, of what was recommended versus what was spent. Um, and then if you do, and I appreciate Representative Baumbach noticed that add up too. If you, any committee members recognize any concerns with our additions, we'll make sure to update that. And just to lay the groundwork, we, the next two meetings will be three hours long. We will use this scenario that you all see in front of you and we'll work from that. We can pull up applications on the side to be looking at them. Uh, but essentially, this is what we will work from. I believe all our committee members have been here before, so they're used to this. But members of the public, this is our, our spreadsheet of fiscal year 26, column F. This represents what each applicant re um, requested. We have G, G is the fully funded. So if we funded them at the request that they submitted, we will create a new tab. Um, so it'll be H. Uh, and that will be us playing around with numbers of what totals will be based on what we recommend. Um, and then also, just for other um, informational purposes, we do go back to fiscal year 24 just to illustrate what was funded. And then we fiscal year 25, we have what the recommendations were and what was actually funded. So that's where you'll see the switch funded programs that we recommended at zero were in fact funded. So you'll see why our, our numbers aren't adding up of what we recommended. Um, with that being said, we are nearing the end of this, so I do apologize. The first meeting is always jam-packed, uh, but just to repeat, our next two meetings will be three hours long, so I, I personally feel we will get all of our work done in those two meetings. However, we do have a fourth meeting scheduled, um, but are there any other comments from committee members that you want to get on record beforehand um, before we close out to public comment? If not, again, my email inbox is open. Please send over applicants you want to hear from, and I'll send a summary out of what I heard um, from each of you today of who you'd like to see. So any closing thoughts, comments? All right, I'm not seeing any, so I'm going to go ahead and move to the public comment portion of our, of this presentation. We do have some attendees in pub um, in person. However, none of them have signed up for public comment. I am going to ask that participants, 
you should have the right to raise your hand or type in the chat if you'd like to comment. Awesome. I see Kate. Um, so yeah, if you could just start doing that, put your hand up if you're able to. If not, please put in the chat that you'd like to comment. Um, but I am going to put over to Kate uh, Dupont-Phillips. She's with Healthy Community Delaware to give comments. So Kate, you can unmute yourself. Please introduce yourself and we welcome you to give about two minutes of public comment. Should you have it. Thank you, Jules. Um, and this will not be long. I'm Kate DuPont-Phillips. I'm the Executive Director of Healthy Communities Delaware, which Sequoia presented on. Thank you so much, Sequoia. I did just want to make a note that because the uh, application period was moved back this year, um, we are on a fiscal year uh, budget, and we did not actually have our data for FY24 in at the time of the submission in July. So I just wanted to note that the application reflect something different than you just heard from Sequoia. And what Sequoia shared is the most recent data. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. And go ahead, Secretary. Yeah, I just, I want to add, I believe some of uh, the applicants may have raised some of those concerns uh, early on in the application process. And to the extent there's anything that is uh, that someone feels needs to be addressed for that reason, for fiscal year re reason, anything that's a result of the timing being shifted, uh, please feel free to reach out to us and share that update. Uh, if you feel it's necessary to request to uh, talk about that, we can put you on the agenda to talk about it as well. Uh, we don't want anyone feeling like they were limited in their application or couldn't uh, fully submit their application. So please reach out to us if you have any concerns about that. Yes, thank you, Secretary. So Kate, with that being said, if you have any other supporting documents and updated data that you would like to get to the committee, please send that my way. I appreciate that, Secretary. Um, Will do, thank you. Thank you. Uh, looks like we only have one member in the public online, that's Alex, great to have you back. Let me, I'm gonna promote you to a panelist so you can put on your video if you'd like. Actually, Alex, it's for some reason not letting me promote you, so I'm going to allow you to talk. So you should be able to jump in now. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. Um, my, thank you so much. My name is Alex Casper, and I'm the Director of Advocacy for the American Lung Association. According to the 2024 National Youth Tobacco Survey, youth vaping continues to be a serious public health concern, even with the decline in regular users from 5.4 million to 1.6. The results, though, highlight a deeply troubling high addiction rate of youth who vape with more than a quarter or 26.3% doing it daily. Kids continue to follow the available flavors with almost 87.6 of youth who vape reported using flavored products, including mint and menthol. We are now also closely watching the increasing popularity of nicotine pouch products like Zin and others. These products have not received authorization from the FDA to be sold in the U.S., but come in kid-friendly flavors and contain a significant amount of nicotine, causing them to be extremely addictive. While the survey did not show a statistically significant increase in high school and middle school use of these nicotine pouches, the Lung Association is closely monitoring so that these products don't become the next product to cause an epidemic. Funding for tobacco control prevention and cessation as the original intent of the Delaware Health Fund is critical now more than ever. We appreciate the advisory committee's continued commitment last year with sustained increased funding. We understand that the advisory committee always has a difficult task at hand, but we encourage you to continue to remain focused on funding for tobacco programs and cancer programs, and these programs must be fully funded at their requested amount. Thank you for the opportunity to provide comments and your continued commitment and support of tobacco prevention efforts in Delaware. Thank you, Alex. Secretary, that concludes public, public comment. Okay. With that, I would entertain, entertain a motion to adjourn. I make a motion to adjourn. Thank you, Mr. Purcell. Is there a second? Second. I couldn't. It was Autumn. Autumn, thank you, Autumn. Thank you, Autumn. Okay, we are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Gracias.